it's very nice to welcome you here with John Briere, who you see in the screen, and Emily Porter, who will be your hostess with the mostest to help you uh, answer questions, you know, put things in the chat line and all that. So let me start off, um, besides for welcoming you, telling you what we're going to do for the next half hour, um, and then we will be off and running with John. Uh, so first, um, as I've mentioned, uh, you're, we'd like this to be as interactive as possible. And if you feel comfortable and having your camera on, that's great. It's always nice to see faces. If not, that's fine too, but you can put questions either in the chat box or uh, in the raising hand function. Or finally, if your camera's on, you wanna do this, we will recognize that as a wave as well. Uh, for any questions you have to John uh, about the, the topics he'll be talking about today, or if you have questions about the Cancun program in general, uh, of course, uh, you're welcome to ask those questions. Um, we will be sending out uh, a video to all of you who are here right now and those who aren't here but are interested in seeing this interview. Uh, so you'll get that in the next few days. With that, you get a coupon for a discount because we we're giving discounts to people who are signing up and attending our Q and A's with our speakers. Uh, so Emily will will send you that as well. Uh, also, the um, live transcription is possible. If you'd like to see closed caption and see the words as well as hear them, you can use the live transcription um, box in the bottom of your Zoom screen, and uh, you can see those words. Um, I think those are the introductory remarks. Emily, did I leave anything out that I should be saying? Thank you, Emily. Um, okay, so John Breer is presenting for us in Cancun after many, many, many years, probably 20 years of presenting for us in Toronto. So I'm sure John, it would be nice to go to, to Cancun in February as opposed to Toronto in February. And I thought we'd just start off by talking about trauma treatment generally. And um, you wrote Principles of Trauma Treatment, which really kind of had quite an impact in the field. And was it 1996, the first edition? Do you remember? Probably, yeah. Maybe. Sometime in the distant past before uh, this millennium. And I'm wondering what you saw the trauma field like then and what you were trying to contribute then and how you've seen it evolve over these past 20 plus years and also what you might see about the future of trauma treatment. Big question, several of them at one time. Thanks, John, very much for being here. Sure. By the way. Well, nice seeing you, Michael and Emily. This is great. Uh, as you know, you're my favorite people, so uh, this is fun. Um, wow, what a question. Uh, I don't know how much impact I personally have had on the field, but as someone who's observed it, as well as being involved in it on one level or another, I've just seen us go from from uh, sort of two competing dynamics early on to something more complicated now. I think when we started in this area, which uh, I guess my first book was in the 89 uh, Therapy for Adults Molested Children. I think at that time, um, there were sort of two models operating, one with an advocacy model, which I was quite involved in, which had a political component and it was talking about the oppression of women and children. And, sexual aggression as a pandemic, uh, watch out for that word now, uh, pandemic uh, impact on people's lives. And that was, uh, that involved a really cool involvement of people like Sandy Butler and other people who were just brilliant feminist uh, people talking about these things. I think at the other end of the spectrum, there were people trying to understand how to actually do therapy uh, and were running up against the headwinds of classic societal notions of what this stuff meant, you know, you've probably heard someone say this, but a couple of generations ago, the comprehensive textbook of psychiatry estimated that one out of every 1 million people had experienced sexual abuse. Uh, we've now updated those numbers by a slight number, maybe a factor of a thousand or something. Uh, so there was a belief then that uh, sexual abuse was probably, uh, reports were actually due to histrionic or dysregulated young women who uh, were uh, later what would perhaps be called false memory, but in those days um, would be uh, sort of laboring under delusion. They'd been hurt when they hadn't. So you can imagine that those days were fascinating. They were very contentious. 
Uh, many of us were pretty much <laughs> felt like we were in a battleground, but ironically, the the goal of the work was not battle. It was it was resolution and love and and trying to help people and stop other people from being hurt. Um, so there were those kind of competing but not new, new, completely neutralizing uh, uh, perspectives. So a lot of the early therapists, I think, were very heartfelt, very uh, caring, very invested in working in this area. And uh, they did amazing things. And it's, it's really kind of amazing that in, from like 1980, you know, we've come so far. In 1980, sex abuse survivors, LGBTQ, people uh, exposed to racism, uh, just every group of, of categories of people who were so marginalized in those days with social support for it, um, that it's amazing we are where we are now. Sometimes I just wanna check out and watch and just see how far we've come and to be so pleased that I could be part of that, however peripheral in terms of just we we have burgeoned so much. So I think where we are now, Michael, more, and what do I know? But I mean, it feels to me like what one now we have on one pole is science. There are many, many studies and articles on treating people who've been traumatized. But that field has been all split by the fact that a lot of people are dealing with sort of the cognitive behavioral treatment of single traumas, like war, war isn't really single trauma, but war trauma, sexual assault, those kinds of things. And then a very large group who are bringing in the notion of complex trauma that we have to look at people's entire lives, including how they were hurt very early on, how they were unloved, et cetera, not just physical acts of trauma, but acts of omission, et cetera. Uh, so the field is growing scientifically by leaps and bounds. And I think uh, what I've tried to do in that regard a little bit is see if we can take those developments and apply them uh, not in an antithetic way, but in a different sort of way. So I'm very interesting, interested in what's happening in the VA and what's happening in clinics around the world who are dealing with rape trauma through cognitive behavioral treatments and stuff. But my work as a, someone who's been studying, for instance, Buddhist psychology for 20 years and has done some writing and work in that area, and someone who I think really appreciates how much we're all sort of bozos on the same bus here trying to do the best we can, uh, including the therapists, uh, means that uh, from my perspective, I, I find myself being pulled out of this, uh, although I, I've developed a cognitive behavioral treatment for burns, so I'm not trying to burn survivors, so I'm not trying to say I don't do that stuff, but starting to realize in the bigger frame of all of us doing the best we can, struggling with life as it is, um, you know, how can we uh, help people when we ourselves are suffering, we come from the same culture that hurt other people and vilified other cultures. How can we move forward in a way that's an integration? And I don't want the integration to, to sacrifice either pull. We can't get rid of the science. It's very, very important. And I'm a scientist, so I would say that. Uh, but I don't. I think that the notion of focusing on mindfulness and compassion and appreciation of the fact that we're all suffering, especially in such contentious times politically, which are heartbreaking for all of us, I think, um, including even the people that are championing the positions that are heartbreaking for us. Many of those people, I think, are suffering in their own ways as well. Well, very contentious, roiled up time, but I, I don't know if I'm overstating this. This is also an amazing time to be a trauma therapist. Uh, you know, my in if I can talk for a minute longer, Michael, on this topic, you know, in Buddhist psychology, people are always looking for enlightenment or they're looking to be on the bodhisattva journey so even if they don't have enlightenment and they don't have to leave this world they could be caring for the well-being of others these are these tremendous uh goals that we have um are are just superordinate in in the work that we have to do right now we're really starting to understand that uh you know, even even there, you know, even in therapy, how many of you would agree with this in a weird way? I don't even know that in therapy we resolve people's psychological symptoms. I think what we do in good therapy, which involves often some version of mindfulness, et cetera, is we change people's relationships to their suffering so that their suffering doesn't hurt as much. So that they, although they have a history of trauma, they've actually developed skills and ways to handle it. And I think that's really, really true for therapists. Um, uh, and this is that dilemma. Remember, everybody in the 90s was talking about burnout. You notice how you don't hear about it so much anymore. Well, I think there's we could talk about that forever. But I don't think the goal of us as therapists is to not be burned out. Actually, uh, what I was 
would like to get at a little bit is I often say people are studying in, in Buddhist mindfulness with me, and I mean me as a co-attendee or as someone who's talking about it. Um, the the whole notion that we're struggling against is how could we broaden awareness and compassion of our world? Well, you know what? Therapist, awesome, perfect, smack dab right in the middle of it. You're sitting here. You, why did you decide to do this? You could have been an investment banker. But what you did was you decided for probably fairly interesting reasons to open yourself up to the suffering of other people. That's why we got into this biz. We may have been sort of talked out of it through clinical training and other things or just the accumulation of life experiences. But what we're really in this deal for, I think, like I work in a burn unit, not so much anymore, but I did for a long time. Every day, just looking at very badly hurt people. I was amazed, and I hope you won't judge me for this, but I was amazed that over time I felt uplifted and better about people and my not myself per se but just that i was tapping something spiritual by working with such hurt people not by being one up to them because we're all in the same jam we're all going to die we're all going to suffer trauma in our own lives but just that that in a way if you want to be someone who studies the roots of suffering and how to deal with it then probably the best thing to do is be someone who works in that area um, so what I what I guess of one of the take homes that I'm interested in saying is, uh, if you've been involved in clinical training at all, you probably notice that a lot of students get wiser and stronger and smarter and healthier as a function of their clinical training and their work with people. So what I would what I think we are is we're actually vaguely lucky that we chose a profession that is not about resilience per se. It's not about not being burned out per se. It's that it's a tremendous opportunity to join the human family, to look at pain and suffering, not as bad pathological things, but as a result of life, and to see if we can figure out our own relationship to that. And what I think happens is that we, if we're lucky, and it's so much of this is luck, we can enter spaces that allow us to become more wise, more equanimous, more accepting of the suffering of other people and ourselves. Um, and in that way, I honestly think the Bodhisattva journey is the journey of the therapist in many ways, of coming in and then year after year after year being exposed to our difficulties and the difficulties of others and finding ways to not reject or suppress or push that stuff away, but to allow it in and then deal with what we got. And just apropos of our time together in Cancun, perhaps will be this very notion of how can we call on these things to make ourselves, we'll focus a fair amount on counter-transference, which I'd love to talk about if you're interested in a new version, of what, at least what I would say counter-transference is, but the counter-transference is actually just our history talking to us while we're doing therapy. And you know, it's gonna be very important how we can not push away our angry thoughts at our clients or whatever our thoughts might be, or the fact that when we, I don't know about you, but I've sometimes said, oh, please just don't tell me one really, one more really horrible story. Uh, that although we have that perspective, what, what's fascinating, and I don't mean it in a, in a dissociated way, what's fascinating is that if we can engage this stuff, we are, so lucky to be able to develop further as clinicians. So I, I, if you look at a 65-year-old clinician who's been doing trauma work for a while, uh, I think if they're lucky, you're seeing a person has grown and become more wise, and that has helped their clients in two ways, both by A, um, they just know what to do more, including that sometimes taking away symptoms, which hardly ever works, isn't going to work. But then the other part of it is just the notion that we're entering a space of compassion uh, that allows both of us to grow. And Michael, you know that I, I published a gazillion, million, trillion empirical evidence articles in the major and lesser journals. Uh, I'm not like not a scientist, <laughs> but I don't think that chi-squares and degrees of freedom actually summarizes our life experiences. And so we have to sort of wend our way through those two models, which I find, I find that fascinating. Wow. Now, John, you decided for this Cancun program, you want to look at um, uh, clinical dilemmas. And I've heard you speak about a lot of things, and some of related to clinical dilemmas, but you thought that would be a good focus partially because of the interactive nature of just being there and being with people. So tell us more about your thoughts about clinical dilemmas and what therapists are, are facing. So dilemmas in Buddhist psychology represent challenges, but also opportunities for growth or development. And I, I think we need to look at it that way. 
Uh, but the reality is the, the technical dilemmas that we're going to be talking about, I've got them written down here so I can cover them. <laughs> Self-injury, substance abuse, highly dissociated people, people who are sexualizing in their life and maybe the therapist, and just the client who's angry and challenging and very difficult for you. Uh, we do have treatment technologies for those things. That, as you may recall, I, I wrote a book on treating those things with best new ideas in, in what, uh, 2019. Is that right? I, I don't know, something like that, about working with these kinds of patients. And so there, there are clearly things that we can talk about in terms of, we call these things generally just stress reduction behaviors, at least a lot of them. They arise from trauma and they arise from an attempt to actually survive trauma by distracting or soothing or numbing or pulling your pain away from yourself. And they work for survivors on some level. I mean, we shouldn't be trying to liposuction these solutions out of people's heads. However, A, it can be very bad for them. So we want to see if we can help them be better survivors, if you wish, which we all are. Uh, and B, uh, the thing I'm really interested in talking about just a little bit, collegially, not as an expert, Lord forbid, I'm right in the middle of the, of the enmeshment of the I vow deal that we've been struggling with for therapists for hundreds of years. But uh, are there ways for us to deal with our own reactivity to those things, which, which anyone without half a heart or any compassion is going to be overwhelmed by, both seeing so much suffering, but also that, it, <laughs> forgive me, but it's irritating. It's irritating when we're exposed to the limits of our own capacities, that we can't fix everything, that we can't make these things go away, that the mother or schizophrenic uncle that we vowed to develop treatments for when we were little people that caused us to become healers later, those people didn't get better because we developed some cool thing. The reality is like, Life is very, very complicated. And so what this means is that when we're dealing with these dilemmas, I want to talk about how to deal with those dilemmas, but I'd like to spend at least 50% of the time in a vulnerable, not too vulnerable, slightly vulnerable openness to the fact that this stuff is very hard for us, but it's also very growth enhancing potentially for us. And how can we use mindfulness and compassion models. They don't have to be Buddhist oriented. There are many different religious and spiritual traditions beyond uh, Buddhism around how can we watch what's arising in ourselves, see it as evidence for what our lives have been like, also that allows us to have common ground with the client. You know, If you're sitting there being furious because your client is being furious, well, actually, you're both doing the same thing from different perspectives and with different roles. But you know, there's something very fascinating about that. But the, the, the biggest thing I think in the short term that can accrue, not obviously from a silly little five day, half day workshop thing like this, I'm not saying it's silly, Michael, sorry, wrong word, um, is just the notion that these are not things that are burnout material. These, this is life. And the more that we are empathically attuned to suffering, the more we're going to feel what's going on. But that doesn't mean that we have to be debilitated by or that we can't grow by. You know, it's been said, I'm sliding into my mindfulness uh, lectures now, I'm sorry. It's been said that Dalai Lama cries every morning when he wakes up. Now, I don't know whether that's true. Seems like a pretty cheerful guy to me, but I can see how he might. And it's been discussed in the, in the world a lot. And one of the interpretations is if you actually could see, you'd be sad. You know, we're sitting here with our happy faces, and that's really good. But if we could really realize that right now there's a kid being abused four blocks from us, uh, women are being horribly treated in various environments, people are being subject to marginalization by race or LGBTQ status or something else, and we could just look at the amount of pain in the world, it would hurt us. Now, is the Dalai Lama sad when he's crying? I know this is pretty weird stuff, but no, I think he, and he sort of talked about this. He's not really, he's crying because it's out there and it's sad, but it doesn't mean that he gives up on it or that it means something that those things can't be helped or assisted or that we can't change our, our ways of relating with them. And so uh, I think that, that uh, when we look at these dilemmas, we want to look at it uh, as challenges to effective treatment, but also gifts. And then I want to specifically see if we can look at countertransference. I went through the analysis for 10 years for good or for bad, mostly for good. Uh, and I've been through other therapies because I needed a lot of therapy in my life. Um, you know, I know that uh, countertransference is a thing. It does involve uh, some kind of an activation of your own internal states that cause you to be different with your client than maybe 
you could be, and maybe the biggest thing is we make what we sometimes call a source attribution error. We confuse our own activated counter-transferential dynamics with the perception of the client and therapy. We're actually missing out a lot on what, what's going on because we're now responding to our own internal productions rather than other, you know, than what's going on with our client. But this is just, as Ram Dot said many years ago, this is grist for the mill. This is the cool stuff. So how can we look at our counter-transferential impulses, judgments, perceptions, and how can we address them with compassion for self and for others? I don't blame any of us that have the most fierce counter-transferential reactions in the world because the reason we do is because life set us up to have the experiences that led to us responding that way. But if we can have a soft and gentle approach to our own reactivity and our own thoughts and not to say, I just had a hateful thought towards my client, I must be a bad therapist, they need someone better to, but instead to say, aha, I know this sounds kind of zooey ooey, but uh, ah, an arising negative thought about my client, which comes from my father. <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a kind of a cooler thing. Uh, we do workshops on how clients, what clients can say to themselves when they get triggered. And one workshop participant said, a therapist who's a pretty brilliant woman, said that her favorite thing when she gets triggered is, hi, mom. So what does it do when we say hi, mom? Or what does it do when we say hi, toxic society that's devaluing people because of who they love or the skin color or whatever? You know, hello, but that, you know, not hello in a, in a silly way, but just sort of, ah, this is what's arising. Then two things I think can come from it. We can gain new information on ourselves and find new ways to appreciate our suffering, uh, which doesn't have to be melodramatic. But it also means that uh, this is sometimes called metacognitive awareness. So, you know, I don't know if that, that terms make it very much in regular general psychological literature, but metacognitive awareness is among other things, something that arises from mindfulness, which is the realization that just because you think something doesn't mean it's true. Just because you feel something, it doesn't mean it's true. If you think you suck, that doesn't mean you suck. If you are afraid right now, it doesn't mean the world is dangerous. If you have a counter-transferential urge to hug your client or scream at them, or you have a sexual thought, or you have a frightened thought, or you suddenly remember your poor grandmother, or your own miscarriage three months ago is making it very hard to work with women who are talking about whatever issues, that these things are, I don't want to be Pollyannish, but they are gifts in a way. So we should be happy that we have our own reactivity. You know, if you're a classic cognitive behavioral therapists of the short-term school, the therapeutic relationship doesn't matter too much. And I've heard some of my colleagues say that directly. And what's going on with you doesn't matter too much because you're doing stuff that you're doing, right? You've learned that to do this stuff. But what's so weird about our job, right? In the trauma world, to the extent that that's what we're doing, or frankly, all therapies, trauma therapy, if you ask me, is we're airlifting ourselves into very difficult circumstances. And it's like an alien said, what do you do for a living? Well, I find very hurt people and then I hang out with them in a very intense way. Oh, and by the way, I have the same issues my clients have. Well, why do you do that? Well, yeah, that's sort of an interesting question. Uh, but what it does mean is that we can't, when we airlift ourselves into these circumstances, why do I find myself in a burn unit? Why do you find yourself next Tuesday seeing that patient who's heartbreaking for you? What are you doing? Why are you trying? How are you doing it? And what's involved in it for you? The reality, the analysts have been saying this forever, is probably the best therapy involves us being there too, actively related to and involved in the process. But if we're going to be actively and related, related in the process of someone who's just been set fire to by their father or who, uh, who was sexually assaulted or who I've worked in sex trafficking a fair amount in the past and who's been exploited in these various ways, worked in tortures a lot. It's colored a lot of my work. Um, you know, working with people like that tells us what humans are capable of doing to each other. Uh, it also activates our sort of psychic gaze aversion. We don't want to look at it. But so many people have been tortured. There's so much of that out there. And there's levels of torture that don't involve cattle prods or urination in a prison cell or on your face or maltreatment or being gang raped or whatever. There's maltreatment out there that's microaggressions against people that don't fit into our world. There's all the lonely people out there. There are all the people who are, quote, too heavy or too skinny or too black or too white, too old, too young. Um, that means that we're all uh, dealing with some version of these situations. I like to say, 
uh, in diversity training environments. Uh, you know, you may not think you're in one of those categories, but you probably are. You know, and if you're not, hang in there, you will be because you're going to get old and then you're going to really be devalued in a whole new way. It won't matter what you've done. You're a husband. You know, if you buy that stuff, you could get pretty bummed about being old. I happen to think that getting old is one of the coolest things I've seen so far. I don't like the ultimate uh, result of getting old, which is you kick the bucket. That could be irritating. But the process is probably more of this engagement and appreciation. Now, there are Dharma teachers now. There's a whole series, some of you are probably familiar with this, about the Zen of growing old or the Vipassana of growing old. But that's actually, that's dealing with suffering too. Uh, I wander astray, Michael. Please bring me back to whatever I was supposed to be talking about. But John, I love when you wander astray because my mind is so boggled in so many ways and uh, in, in a good way, um, always when, when you present. So I think because we we don't have a lot of time. First, I you know thank you for boggling my mind. I don't know where everyone else stands, but if people have questions or comments to John about anything he said or whatever, please feel free to put them in the chat box or or, or uh, Emily can call you to the screen to ask. And I'll say a few things. Um, you can tell why John was invited to join us in Cancun if you haven't seen John before, because uh, it's an amazing experience to be with him. And this will be a small group experience uh, with, with opportunities for more interaction than sometimes at, at workshops. Uh, the whole concept of doing this, um, as John knows, was how can you go learn stuff in February in a beautiful place and have a lot of time to have fun, to relax, and just to get away from your normal routine. And, and John lived in Winnipeg for a long time. I've been in Toronto for a long time. And February just seemed to be the right time to go away. <laughs> Uh, so uh, we chose a really beautiful resort. It's all inclusive. It has lots of restaurants and bells and whistles and, you know, great things about it. And our website uh, has lots of information and photographs. You can go to the hotel website as well uh, to learn more about that part of the experience. Um, and John will be meeting with the group in the mornings from 9 to 1230 in a kind of a standard large ceiling meeting room that they that uh, often hotels have a very large room and we won't take a lot of space in that room um, also in the mornings there'll be yoga uh, with our own private teacher for our group we're doing some excursions the other thing that's happening john your week which i haven't told you about is that in the other room there'll be tammy nelson who's kind of a sex and couples therapist a very cool person um, who's written some books and presented a lot. And she said, I would love to do a session for couples, not just people who are at the workshop, but even for you know, anyone who's come to her workshop or your workshop, John, and their partners or people who can come alone. So on Wednesday night, there'll be an opportunity for everyone to be invited. Of course, there's no extra charges, no nothing. It's just like if you feel like spending your evening with Tammy Nelson, uh, talking about couples, and she said it's going to be a fun, interesting night, so that's going to happen as well. Um, uh, and as I mentioned, we're offering, for those of you who missed it, uh, a discount for those who signed up for this workshop. When you when you book the, whole, the workshop and the accommodations, we have all that, that information on the Ken Kuna website as well, and Emma will send that to you. So that's just a brief, it may, may have sounded like an infomercial, but um, maybe it was. But last year when, I, when we were there with Bessel van der Kolk and a group, uh, we had to cancel three or four weeks at this resort because of COVID. Uh, we just found that, that that resort met all our expectations and people had a ball. And there's even a, on our Cancun website a little video about uh, what's coming up with some people commenting about what it was like for them. So, um, I'd like to just open it up now if anyone has any comments to John or questions about anything John was talking about or anything about the Cancun experience. So I'll turn it over to Emily for now and see what if we have anything yet or at all. Um, I'm not seeing any yet, um, but based on some of our previous Q&As, um, our audience would like to know what type of or what level of training this will be considering the topic is challenging clients and complex trauma is this a beginner is this a intermediate is this an advanced or what 
type of training or what type of uh, prerequisite is required to take this training? Uh, I think we're all in the beginner category, at least certainly I am. Uh, so uh, I don't think that's critical. I think the critical thing is, are you a therapist? Are you in training for a therapist to be a therapist? Uh, have you discovered that there's a knife's edge between appreciating the suffering of other people and still being able to maintain what I sometimes call dispassionate compassion, the ability to be caring for the well-being of others without being pulled into it yourself uh, and into difficult dynamics? Uh, so I think it would be fine for anyone uh, to attend that. And by the way, you don't have to be a mindfulness person at all. Um, you know, you don't have to have that as a prerequisite either. If you're interested or you're not interested in that, that's perfectly fine because this won't be Buddhism 101. Thank you. Well, we'll just, uh, if anyone would like to join in, please let us know now. Otherwise, it's about time uh, that we were going to end, but I just wanted to give you the opportunities. Um, it's so nice that these days of our experience with COVID, it's very nice to see people on the screen who I've seen before many times of, since COVID started, when we started doing things online, and people who've been there in person with us in Toronto, as well as, as new names and, and faces as well. Um, so I think at this time, it'll be time to close. And John, thank you very, very much for joining us this morning in California, this afternoon for everyone else. And looking forward to seeing you, John, of course, and um, in a few months in a beautiful place. And I wish everyone else a very good day wherever you are. Thank you.